morning, we are going to be in a couple of different places in our Bibles. I'm going to mention those now, so if you want to write it down and be kind of opening your Bibles to, to find the place, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 1, uh, Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter eight or 22, and Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll give you, I'll go over those again and give you the page numbers also. But just to, if you want to jot down Leviticus chapter one, Genesis chapter eight, Genesis twenty-two, and Hebrews chapter ten. Uh, as I mentioned here, you know, years ago I read this article about how many lines of code our brains have to write or read or whatever produce so that we can stand up and walk across the room and turn off the light switch. But we don't ever think about it. Those are just things we do as a habit. And as I mentioned to the kids, I think sometimes we go to church without even thinking about it. We can sit here in this pew, we can take that bread, we can drink the cup, we can make our offering, we can sing our song, we do all of this without really ever even thinking about it. And I want us to start focusing on worshiping. And so I'm going to do a series of lessons here uh, this Sunday, next Sunday, and then I'm actually going to be gone for two Sundays. Tasha needs some help out in Colorado, so Dory and I are going to be going out there. But, but I'm going to be focusing our, our sermons for a while on worshiping. Not how we worship or why we worship or the correct worship or anything like that, but just lessons that over the years I have discovered passages of Scripture that that just lead me to worship. And I'm going to share those with you. You might hear me say some things that you've heard in the past. I've been here for 20 years. Some of these are very personal things, things that really brought me into an understanding of worship and uh, into a place of worship. And so I'm going to be sharing some of those with you, and maybe, it, maybe it's some of them again. One is like the passage we're going to be looking at this morning in Leviticus chapter 1. Now you can find that on page 71, but we're going to be looking at a couple other places before we get there. Leviticus chapter 1 is Moses' instructions on how a worshiper is to offer a burnt offering. But before Moses gives those how-to instructions, the people already knew something about burnt offerings. Burnt offerings were where an animal is sacrificed, it's skinned, it's cleaned out, and everything of the animal is burned on an altar, and the aroma goes up to God. Leviticus chapter 1, Moses writes instructions on how the worshipers are to do that. But before that, in Genesis chapter 8, Noah makes a burnt offering. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham makes a burnt offering. So the people, before they get the how to do it, they also already had some idea of what goes on in these burnt offerings. And so we're going to start looking at the burnt offering offered by Moses or by Noah. Genesis chapter 8. This is on page 6 in the Brown Pew Bible. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Give you some time to find that in your Bible. Genesis chapter 8, verse 18. Now, this is what Moses or Noah does after the flood. Most of you are familiar with the fact that, in fact, actually, let's turn back, uh, go back just a little bit to Genesis ch chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. Because this is what brought the flood on. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. And so the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor with God. So God looks out. The heart of man is evil all the time. And God says, not going not to put up with this. And so he causes the great flood. Every man, woman, child, and animal is wiped off the face of the earth except for Noah and his offspring. 
and their wives. And so, the reason for the flood is that man's heart was evil all the time. Okay? Now, so now flip over with me to chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. So after the flood, so Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives and all the animals and all the creatures that moved along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark, one after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he offered burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all, destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, summer and winter, night and day, or day and night will never cease. <clears throat> now, I want us to notice verse 21. Even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. We like to think that, you know, God flooded the earth because every inclination of man's heart was evil all the time. So he floods the earth and then man comes off of the ark and man is good and pure and wonderful and wholesome. But that's not the case. Even after the flood, God understood that every inclination of man's heart is evil all the time. And we have to keep that in mind. Man's heart did not become perfect after the flood. Everybody got that? Okay, so I'm going to say it. You guys say amen. Man's heart did not get, become perfect after the flood. Amen. Okay, you got it. So it's not man's perfection that now makes God say, I'm never going to do this again. What touched the heart of the loving God was this aroma. This pleasing aroma of the burnt offering. It was man coming, and no one knew that his heart wasn't perfect. We're gonna, if you read through on the story, you find out that Noah and his sons, they weren't perfect, and I think they knew that. But he offers his sacrifice, saying, God, I know we're still not perfect, but you have blessed us through this already. Please don't do it again. And so that burnt offering, that aroma that goes up to God pleases God and averts his wrath a second time. God says, never again will I do that. But it's not man's goodness that, that keeps God uh, wrath averted. It's that pleasing aroma to God. And this is something the Israelites knew. Burnt offerings avert God's wrath, bring God's blessing. They please God. So that's one thing they knew. And then we get over into chapter 22. This is where they learn something else about about uh, burnt offerings. Genesis chapter 22. If you're using the Brown Pew Bible, it's on page 14. You can turn over there and follow with me. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22. This is where Abraham offers a burnt offering. And Israel is going to learn a little bit more about, that, about burnt offerings and what their role is. In verses 1 and 2, sometime later... God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. Now I tell you, if you were writing uh, a movie script, and, and the movie was going to be in segments. I, let's put it a, a TV movie, you know, where you've got several episodes on different nights. This is where you'd stop episode one. Where God says to him, I want you to take your son and offer him as a burnt offering. This means killing, gutting, skinning, cutting up of your son. And we need to let that tension kind of soak in because the, the first readers of this, or even Abraham himself, this was just shocking, shocking stuff. And then we pick up reading down in verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he saddled his donkey. He took two with him, or he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. 
And on the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. Remember, the knife is needed because there's going to be a killing. And as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Next week on the testing of Abraham, perfect place for the, for the end of the episode because there's tension here and there's supposed to be. What's going to happen? And most of us have read the story. Most of us have heard the story. And so we, we miss the tension that's there, but it's supposed to be there. We're supposed to realize this is a passion. This is a horrible thing that's about to take place. He has to kill his own son. So picking up with me in verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Very important. He offered the ram instead of his son. Who was supposed to die on that mountain? Isaac. But God provides an animal to be substituted for the man so that the animal will die and not the man. And so some of the things that Israel, the nation of Israel, knew by the time we get to Leviticus chapter 1 is burnt offerings are pleasing to God and the smell of them averts his wrath and brings blessing. And also that the heart of man is still evil all the time. Got that? So man's heart is always deserving of death, even after the flood. But even though man's heart makes him deserving of death, God provides an animal to be sacrificed in place of, instead of, the man. You guys with me on all this? Yeah. If you are, say amen. amen. Okay. Or say woo! 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 You guys are better at the amen. But we'll work on that. So those are some things before we get to Leviticus chapter 1. So now turn over with me to Leviticus chapter 1. Page 71. In your pew Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Leviticus chapter 1. So we know a little bit about what it means, but here we get to the how it's done. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal, either from the herd or from the flock. This is the offering that an individual person would make. This is not you know, a, an offering necessarily for a specific sin I've done. This is an offering because my heart is still evil all the time. There's still thoughts in my heart that shouldn't be there. And so this is in instructions for the individual worshiper. Verse 3 says, If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd... He is to make to offer a male without defect. Now, if you go down in verse 10, it's from the flock. So this is either going to be a male bull, a young bull, or it's going to be a young ram, a sheep. And it's going to be without defect. And he must present it at the tent of meeting so that it will be accepted to, acceptable to the Lord. 
This is to be without defect. It's the best you got. The best young ram, the best young bull that you have in your herd, that's the one you're supposed to sacrifice. Meaning, it's something. It's going to cost you something. This is not something trifle. It's not something easy. And then you pick up in verse 4, He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. The, the laying the hand on the head is symbolic for a couple of different things. First of all, it brings close contact with the animal. It's like a pet, almost. You're putting your hand on it. You're touching this thing. That's going to become important. We'll see in a little bit. But also, what you're doing is you're recognizing my sin. The sin of my heart is now on this animal. My heart deserves for me to die, for me to be slain. But God has provided this animal to die in my stead. So then we pick up in verse 5. He is to slaughter the young bull before the Lord. And then Aaron's sons, the priest, uh, shall bring the blood and sprinkle it against the altar on all sides at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Notice uh, the worshiper is the one that has to kill the animal with a knife, up close, personal. It's not a concept. You know, we talk about, you know, dying for someone. And in our minds it's a concept, but, but this is something dying and, and you're killing it. It's very personal and it's very hard to do. Let me ask, how many of you have ever killed an animal with your hands? With a knife or something. A few of us have. Uh, I remember the first time I took a girlfriend out once. I was going to butcher a goat and show her how manly I was. We'd put them up on a little rack and we'd tie their legs together and then you just slit their throat with a knife. Yeah. And it's got to be done somehow. And I remember I told her, I said, this may not be a, a, an easy thing for you to watch, so you might want to stay in the pickup. And so I've got the goat up there. The goat's laying there going, rah, rah, rah. That's a pretty good goat, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the goat's looking at me the whole time. I looked over in the cab of the pickup where my girlfriend was, and this is back in high school. It wasn't Dory, but... Uh, looked over in the cab of the pickup and she's looked back, looking back to the windshield, tears just kind of rolling down her eyes. That was the hardest goat I've ever had to butcher. Because it's, it's personal. I mean, it's right there. It's brutal. It really is. Did you eat them? I did. <laughs> That made it all worth it. But I want you to get the brutality of it, Doris, okay? Uh, it, it is brutal. And that's what God says the worshiper has to do. He has to kill it. He has to slaughter it. And then picking up... Did you have a second day? <laughs> not going there, Brian. <laughs> Let, let's get this back on track here, okay? Leviticus chapter 1. Verse 7, the sons of Aaron and the priest are to put fire on the altar and arrange the wood on the fire. And then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat on the burning wood that is on the altar. He, meaning <coughs> the worshiper, is to wash the inner parts and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn <coughs> all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Very hands-on. The feeling of the animal's head under your hand. The feeling of its sticky blood on your hands and on your clothes. The sounds of death. The gurgling. The gasping for breath. The smell of the blood. The sight of of the water and the blood mixing together as it's being washed, and then the smell of the meat and the fat and everything cooking. This is very intense. And that aroma is pleasing to God because the worshiper has done this to submit to God. 
God remembers His promises. He remembers that He uh, that the man deserves death. The worshiper remembers that His heart makes Him worthy of death. But God has provided an animal to die in His stead. There's a the worship. This is worship. This is praising the God who saves us. There's a passage in Hebrews where Hebrew says, the writer of Hebrews says that these offerings were made on an annual basis to remember the sins. When we come to God to worship Him, there's a remembrance of the fact that my heart is still only on evil all the time. And church, this is where we need to be mentally when we gather to worship. We come before God. We are not worthy to be here because my heart is continually evil all the time. And so is yours. We don't like to admit it. We like to think we're pretty good people. We're pretty nice. Pretty giving. But if we'll seriously look at our heart, there's some greed there. Amen? And a little bit of selfishness. A little bit of rebellion. Maybe some lust. Thirst for power. Materialism. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that there's times in our lives where we know what God really wants us to do, but our heart leads us astray and we do stuff that we know that God really doesn't approve of, right? We're not perfect, are we? And so none of us deserve to stand in front of God. Our hearts deserve death. And that's where we need to start when we first come to worship God is realizing that our hearts make us worthy of death, but the God who saves us provides an animal in our stead. And so we come here today, and as we should every week, because every week this ought to be a reminder of our sin, and we go through what they did in Leviticus chapter 1. We place our hand on the head of our animal, an animal that's pure and faultless without sin, unblemished. It's a lamb that God has provided for us. The only thing is when we put our hand on his head, we don't feel wool. We feel human hair. And we look down, and instead of seeing a little lamb there, we see Jesus looking back at us. And the first thing that ought to come to our minds is, I can't do this. It's hard enough for me to even contemplate killing an animal with my hands. I cannot put to death a man. And Jesus stands and looks at us and he says, but this is why I came. I was sent here to die for you. Your heart deserves death, I know, Lance. But the reason I came was to die in your stead. I need to be put to death. I need to die for you. Let's go back. I mentioned a passage out of Hebrews a little bit ago, and I want us to turn there and read that. Hebrews chapter 10. It's on page 850 in your pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> The writer of Hebrews says the law was only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshiper would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices, like the ones in Leviticus, are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. And he's speaking to God here. He said, But a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. 
And then he said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. And then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every high priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when this priest, when Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. And I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Jesus came as our sacrifice to stand in our stead. We, our hearts, deserve death. But God provided a sacrifice for us. And that sacrifice is Jesus. Without Him, our hearts are still condemned. He didn't just push our sin aside like the old covenant sacrifices did. He did away with them completely. Next week we're going to talk about the holy God and the common people and a clean God and an unclean people and, and how those don't interact. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how a sacrifice cleanses us. But church, I want us to get this idea and this understanding that it is never our righteousness that lets us stand before God. Amen. Our hearts are unworthy. But God loves us so much that He provides a way. And it was a very expensive way for you and I to be able to approach Him. That way is His Son, Jesus Christ. So when we come together worshiping the God who saves us, we can't do it in a mindless way without thinking. We need to, to admit our sin. And recognize our hearts are wrong. And then we need to thank God for providing a sacrifice for us. So if you're here this morning and you've accepted Jesus as your sacrifice, then we, we need to thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Because, man, we'd be lost without it. But there may be some of you here this morning who have never accepted Jesus as your sacrifice. Maybe you didn't really understand it. Hopefully this morning you do understand it a little better. If there is someone here this morning who's never accepted Jesus and wants to, we always provide an opportunity for you to do that. One of the most awesome ways to worship God is to come to Him and say, I want what you've offered. So this morning, we're going to stand, we're going to sing this song. If you need to accept Jesus as your sacrifice, as the Savior of your soul, please come forward while we stand and sing.